Hi, welcome to the first installment of the Corporate Cowboys podcast. I am your host, Alex. You can call me Alex or AP. Honestly, I'm just the intern. I have a login and password. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to discount my my role in the organization, but I do want to let you know that, yeah, I am human. I'm real. I'm very real. And uh, the organization itself is uh, very decentralized. Yeah, so the Corporate Cowboys, I felt it was time, really, to start a podcast for the Corporate Cowboys, powered by incorporating associates. Uh, Many of our associates and affiliates are either private or unidentified, unidentifiable, unidentified, confidential. And that's just to uh, maintain integrity. So me, having been tossed the keys to this bitch, I felt it's time to start a podcast because uh, the online presence of Corporate Cowboys in the recent past, very recently, was uh, uh, cut down a little bit, was pared down. Um, I myself had came on and was uh, controlling the uh, social media the, the social media uh, output earlier on the, in the year and my personals got taken down were disabled I don't know for what reason other than going against community guidelines but was never pointed to ones in particular was never pointed to anyone in particular was never uh, told the reason why uh, what post were the ones that were in violation of and uh, just because the um, the business page I suppose the Facebook business page was tied to my then personal email address um, it was also locked out and now nobody can claim it so we're locked out that being said, um, yeah, I suppose all the eggs were in my basket in that at that point in time. But I'm gonna be real with you, Facebook. Facebook um, was just a secondary platform, anyways. This will be. Uh, I I feel like this is a, a great time and a good move to move. What is it to transition over to uh, to voice, not just you know not just images, which is largely what we use Instagram for, to post um, just just quotes, just um, musings that I come across and I hear that I've heard <laughs> in the past in offices and amongst um, our partners. So that being said, this is uh, the first installment of um, the first season. I don't know if we'll have seasons for this. This is this will be largely uh, unstructured in the very beginning, and that's uh, because I took it on as a, I, w- I volunteered, kind of to do this as a as a pet project. Um, having returned to school, I'll be going into a field that requires a lot of orating or oral argument, um, quick rationale. Uh, litigious speaking if you will argumentation and debate and with that said um, I hope to be able to grow more comfortable more comfortable speaking to nobody directly because I'm just speaking into a mic honestly I'm doing this on the move on my phone so it's gonna be it's gonna be very limited in terms of budget but the resources the resources are easy to find but i myself am limited on time so when i can i want to break down crack a cold one if i can if not crank an hour out or even 30 minutes of something that i find cathartic something that i find related to corporate something that i find amusing, motivating, and relay it to y'all in a manner that hopefully enriches your lives. And if not, at least uh, serves to brush away any 
any concerns or any despair about life and death in corporate. <laughs> um, the name Corporate Cowboys, where it came from, um, it's not, it's, it's nothing too crazy, nothing too, too, it's nothing too crazy, it's nothing too far-fetched, but I have planned actually to release a small statement or I guess a podcast episode if you will uh, next year I'll do that 2021 tonight this evening it's December December 20th 2020 so I'm feeling like the episode let's put it out in April so sometime in the middle of April if I can stick with this regimen of recording and releasing, and I'd like to do so at least once a week, come April, I'll uh, speak to the name. I'll speak on the name of Corporate Cowboys, where it came from and its origin. Obviously, I'll be doing so also in the whole time, um, the whole time until then. But uh, <laughs> April 20th is a special day for myself. And I'll let you know. <laughs> it doesn't have to do with weed. It doesn't have to do with marijuana. Those days are um, were were many and in the past. But nowadays, uh, it's more so business related, more so business oriented. And come April twenty, I'll let you know all about it. <laughs> That's a fucking coincidence. So for this first episode, I would like to tell y'all a story of when I was younger. I'm now leaving my 20s, so your boy's been in corporate, in or around corporate, never middle management for going on, what, 10 years now? 11 years now? I mean, I've been working since I was... Since I could fucking work, what was it, like 13, 14? So I'm not shy. I'm no stranger to work, be it manual or menial. But I got my first job at the age of 17. If I got my first job in 2008... And now I'm not going to do the math. But I wanted to tell you a story of, um, of, uh, regarding the title of this episode and why I think skeleton keys are important. I know that they, it, this doesn't relate to, um, to the technical use for them, to the, um, IT use for them where they could be used for computational first day zero day third day exploits nah this is uh, has to do more with social skills social work and that's just a huge fucking umbrella of uh, concepts to dive into but it's more so one that I have come to to grow comfortable with and am able somewhat to explain it without losing myself and so I'll try to relay it to you again keep in mind that that this is all one giant that this the podcast at least is a, is a social experiment of sorts but rest assured I I do expect um some good product from it all all experiments and with products with results with some kind of precipitate precipitate precipitation in their solution some fucking chemistry yeah right um so this first this this first story has to do with i want to say my second or third job and i was only 18 
Was it my third job? Fourth job. I was like 18 at the time. Let's okay, let's just say I was let's say I was 18 at the time. And I was working for a um a restaurant. Not a fast food restaurant. There are different categories of, of restaurants. I mean, you could say fast food is the bottom of the barrel. Honestly, I think it's one of the most riches to walk into and, and speak to the young people who run and operate um, the, the fucking the operation, who pretty much run the operation. Yeah, you, you want to say burger flippers or, or french fry french fry managers or whatever <laughs> but shit i started in a position like that and if i if i can see somebody like myself when i was younger if i can see them now if i can identify them i i know that our generation isn't lost i know that the future is definitely not lost i always have hope in humanity even if it's even if even if they're criminals i have fucking hope for them why because What's right sometimes will be legislated against and becomes a crime, and what's wrong sometimes will be legislated for and made legal. I mean, it's not like it hasn't happened before. That's a fucking, that's another conversation for another time. <laughs> but, um, um, what was I? Right, my skeleton key story. So I worked for a, um, we'll call it like a quick service because yeah, there are different categories of food, um, food, food stores, retail stores. When you're when you're working in in the food industry, there are different class classes of establishments. There's uh, like fast food. There's quick service. Um, there's like a, like a sit down. I guess you could you could say a sit down one with uh, outdoor patios and whatnot, like places with, uh, that might be qualified, that would qualify for slightly more luxurious. So I was at like the quick service level and um, pretty high up there. I'm not going to give the name of the place just yet in case, you know, for whatever reason, the statute of limitations, I should get caught up in it or or say something that would uh, incriminate myself or or the organization, the company. But, hold on, I'm just being reminded here. Right, so I do have a, I do have an ad read. I hope y'all didn't think that this episode was free. Um, <laughs> no, it's nothing serious. It's just something that I wanted to write in. Um, it not being as structured as I'd like it to, I still would like to to give it a little 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 air of originality. So the this podcast, this episode is sponsored by pens. That's right, you heard me right. These pens, all kinds of pens, any kind of pen, fucking ballpoint, roller, gel, permanent. It could be ink or otherwise, ink or blood, but pens, really. Why? Because, I mean, who fucking doesn't like pens, man? I mean, when you, whenever you use a pen, you are not using a phone and you're not using a computer. Pens are damn near permanent. I would, I, I have switched largely since growing up, since growing up. Damn, you could definitely tell that um, I, I still relate to people in age, even though I, I should have been dead three times over already at my age. <laughs> but growing up, I used pencil a lot. Why? Because, well, having an eraser was very convenient. But now that I write stuff in pen, either it's permanent or it's struck through. And I would advise you always to use a pen. Also, I've got like stacks of papers and some notebooks with notes and them all written in pencil and whenever you write or whenever you use a a notebook completely so using both sides of the using both sides of one page using both sides of one sheet for to get both pages filled with writing and then you store that notebook um the 
graphite from a pencil has the tendency to bleed from one side of a paper to the other paper facing it. And um, yeah, dude, I got some fucking notebooks that I can't even use anymore. I can't read anymore because it's just convoluted with graphite and it's just a fucking mess. Pens, on the other hand, don't do that, especially if you use ones that don't run, where the ink does not run, um, and even if they bleed through, then I would suggest you only use one side of your sheet on your on your notebook, on your composition book, on your on your piece of paper, and uh, keep on keeping on with the pens, man, because whenever you write things down. Your keystrokes aren't logged on your computer. Your phone, if you have it in another room, can't hear you. And um, it's like your own little quiet place. <laughs> um, what, what was I saying? Oh, okay. So back to my back to my story. Just a brief intermission for an ad read, for an ad on pens, um, which I don't need, by the way. So I mean, if that was given anybody ideas for, hey, let's reach out to this cat and see if you can, we can sponsor his ass with pens. I mean, maybe a, a, like a little gift package that I could raffle off to to a listener. But no, dude, I've got like a tote, literally a tote that I've kleptoed my way into since I was younger also, which which actually um, through incorporating associates, the adverb, through uh, actively incorporating associates, I've learned that uh, there are plenty of people who do that. Who just have a fucking box, a tote of pens, and I, while I won't willingly say that I stole from others, um, yeah, I mean, if your boy wanted a pen, he either asked for it or he used it long enough where it wasn't missed. So yeah, you could say that I plotted for it, but let's be real: if you're not using your pen, do you know where it is? So yeah, I mean, these won't be missed. <laughs> um, back to my story. So the back to the, to the story on the title of this podcast, on the title of this episode, Skeleton Key, and it has to do with my time working in quick service in a Mexican restaurant, very uh, very renowned restaurant, uh, very very popular um, in the early in the early thousands, in the early two thousands, and then in the twenty tens. They ran into some, some fucking issues. They ran into some shit, literally. <laughs> now that I think about it, um, but I I wasn't there then, so I I did my time and fucking came out. But while I was there, I um, I worked with some some very peculiar individuals and thinking of my time there I have a fuck ton of stories um just on the front line of corporate I mean it really was a corporation I was working for and uh, I I was able to finesse my way and I don't mean finesse like cheat I mean fucking finesse my way with style and grace into a position where I was able to rub elbows with middle managers and um you know this all had to do with my performance as an employee my performance as a fucking hitter like i i just knew how to get the shit done and a lot of that well i mean a lot of that i attribute to the ethic i kept since i was younger i mean i might i might have been a criminal on paper but you know i was i feel like i was raised right i had a work i had a work ethic that could rival just about anybody else that could rival that could rival the best of them fuck it i mean i got promoted plenty of times but that's not the point of my story the point of my story is when i when i was first starting not when i was first starting i had already been on board for quite some time and at this restaurant hold on <coughs> yo my bad so, um, yeah, I'm fucking coughing so you don't notice the cut, but, um, where was I? Because I had a phone call and then I had to take care of something. Yeah, your guy stays busy. Oh, on my story, the skeleton key story. 
So I was working at this um, restaurant, quick service, Mexican Grill. And the assembly line where you start first, um, you you know select your options, burrito, tacos, or, or bowls, or whatever. And you move along down towards the end. And um, just before you hit the cash register, there's, uh, there's always that one singular person there. Maybe uh, a manager, like a supervisor, or just a really capable uh, crew member who's posted up there. And uh, they take your order, greet you or whatever, ask you how your day's going, offer you any chips or salsa or guacamole drinks. And then hand it off to the cash register to the to the cashier, where they ring you up, take your tender, take your cash, take your monies, take your cards. Now you notice how I just glossed over that key facet of their job is to upsell, right? Well, that's that shit, man. That's that shit I was good at. Chips and salsa, chips and walk, all that shit is extra, right? And it's not you know you, you don't just get handed it for free. You ask for it. And it's just handed to you. Nah, I mean, folks got to make money. Folks got to make numbers. Folks got to hit a certain quota during their shift. Or else they're sending people packing because labor (laughs) is overwhelming um, the amount being made for the shift. So um, in doing so, whenever you take the customer's food, whenever you take the guest's food and, and, you, and you greet them eye to eye, you, oh no, you make contact with them, uh, given the context, ask them how their day is going. If, if the line is moving a little slower, the cashier is finishing up with, uh, with one guest while you're handing this one in front of you, then you want to, um, you know, uh, play a little for time and, uh, and in doing so create or, or spin spin that experience in their favor and entice them into buying some chips or some salsa, chips or some guacamole. The guacamole is always a popular option, but this shit's expensive. Even living in California, I mean, we might have connects with folks down south, but it doesn't mean that the avocados are fucking cheap. (laughs) Those bitches are still getting taxed. So, um there was a there there was a there was a while there there was a season there was a time I guess there was a, a short era where I was in this position um before just before the cashier wedged in between the cashier and what was the rest of the assembly line where uh we'll call it the expo and it's uh, essentially where you create the ex like an exposition for the food to the customer and then transition them transfer transfer that experience over to the cashier to finalize their experience in the restaurant and you know bid them a good day bid them a good evening a good afternoon a good night with their food and uh it was it was one of my favorites. Why? Because uh, for one, I wasn't I wasn't getting I wasn't getting dirty. I wasn't getting messy. Though I did, you know, I, I worked every position. I I enjoyed a a pretty fruitful career in that company. I moved up a bit, and um, just up until I I um, just up until I parted ways with them and returned to school. But. That was one of my favorite positions, and uh, there was a, a cashier, a cashier and I, who made a, a pretty a pretty good team. This cashier was a slightly older female, but uh, she was like a like a lesbian, like a kind of like a bull dyke looking stud girl, and um, fuck, she was good at her job. She really was. She knew what the business was. She knew what the game was. She was older. I mean, I was I was a young cat. I was like eighteen, nineteen, and this this girl, this this female, was like in her twenties, at least deep in her twenties. So, um, and and I I knew her from from the street too. So I knew she had a reputation. She was a uh, she was um, 
a figure of crime, I guess you could you could say. I'm not privy to their record, nor would I divulge it, but um, they were very, very streetwise. And I mean, I, I was I was no punk myself. And, you know, I'd, I'd gotten in the rodeo once or twice. I've been around the block. So, you know, game recognized game. I <laughs> game recognized game. We would we would tear shit up and um and hold <laughs> hold little private contests between her and I, little competitions of who could who could upsell the most. So we would trade off on the on the cash box. On the on the till, we would trade off, where you know maybe uh, maybe one or two hours or or maybe w- one day or two days, because you can't you can't switch halfway through a shift or halfway through a a rush because uh, you don't know the exact volume of of folks who are coming into the door but you can dedicate one shift to one or or one shift to another like uh, maybe i take the a.m rush and they take uh the p.m rush the rush hour where the majority of our business comes in through the door and uh, from there, then we're able to to find who's got the better skills. And our goal was obviously to sell the most chips and salsa, the most chips and guacamole we possibly could. And how do you do that? Good fucking question. <laughs> the answer is to not sound robotic. That's the key. Personalizing and customizing a customer experience for every customer that walks through the fucking door is a challenge in its own right. Now upselling, being able to upsell, having that the 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 capability to turn every customer into an upsell, one who wants to take chips and salsa, chips and guacamole for themselves for for their loved one standing next to them, for their significant other, for their child. Who do you think we're selling to, man? We were selling to everyone. Shit gets me hyped, man. I, I I get I get I get goosebumps. I get I get chills on my on my arm just thinking about it on my neck. Why? Because it puts me back into the game when I think about it. I I put myself in that mindset where I'm selling. And I'm obviously not selling drugs. Fucking drugs sell themselves. You just have to be available with them. I'm selling something that they potentially don't want. I'm selling, I'm selling an, an additional source of nutrition, if you if you if you want to call it that. I'm selling an additional form of comfort, something that will supplement their meal. They could have a, a set of tacos. And honestly, I probably wouldn't eat chips with tacos, but if you can sell it to to someone in a manner where they would enjoy pairing chips with tacos, enjoy eating their tacos and then moving over to dip a chip into some wok and munch, you're golden. Why? Because you're you're able to you're able to fulfill this objective you're able to get the satisfaction in knowing that you have the skeleton key. And we would do this with, we would try to do this at least with every customer that came through. Sometimes, yes, there were those customers who who, who could see what we were doing. And um, as soon as we started talking, introduce ourselves or make an introduction, they would say, not interested in chips and walk, no drinks, just the meal and we had no we had no um no grudge against them why because it made our jobs easier the sooner you get to the no the sooner you get to the money why because they still got to pay for the meal they still got to pay for their food before they walk out and leave so it was <laughs> there was never a lose lose it was always win win our goal was to just was to get sharp was to get those those silver tongues moving and being able to to convert individual guests who walk in into repeat customers. Why? Because they enjoyed the 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 convenience, 
they enjoy they enjoy the uh, personalization. Sure, they obviously came in for the ability to customize what they want to eat, but on their way out, how they eat is how you leave them. How they eat is how you leave them. Obviously, you want every experience to be a good experience because if they didn't buy chips this time around, if they didn't buy chips and walk or get the drink like a complete meal this time around, next time around, they know your face. They've seen you before. You've seen them before. And being able to personalize every experience just gives you that much more entry into their, for lack of a better word, wallet. <laughs> gives you that much more entry into their wallet. Sure, into their personal lives if you if you want to, I suppose, create associates from your customers, create a relationship, a friendship. And I was able to do that later on with uh, with promotions as they came up. But that's a story for another time. The point of <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make is is the skeleton key lies and the ability to communicate and the ability to adapt from person to person and how you communicate where your words are essentially tools and you have to you have to really embrace every customer in their entirety take everything that they are framing at you in its entire context with 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 its contextual clues, body language, how they speak, what they're wearing, glasses, do they have a watch, what kind of shoes, you can see the way they stand, how long they look at the phone, at their phones in, in the line, whether or not they have a significant other with them, do they have children, are they alone, are they wearing a hat, is it raining outside, do they have an umbrella, do they have a jacket and no umbrella, do they just have a hood? All these, all these items play, play a role, are factors to factor in. So you could picture us, this cashier and myself as her expo in that position, or me at the cashier and her at the expo, just scoping everybody out in line. And yeah, we would give each other nudges, signals, little signs if, uh, if we weren't too busy and uh, have each other direct our attentions toward to somebody in line who was a who was a who was a ripe prospect for the complete package for the complete experience at Chipotle obviously we want to lay out the red carpet that that wow factor for everyone who walks into the door but if somebody if somebody is coming in on their own lunch break and only wants their food we could tell as soon as they walked into the door. Why? Because they would have on their own work uniform. They would come in already looking at their phone. They'd come in looking at a watch. They would come in talking on the phone. So so we know if, if folks are acting, if folks are, are working in a professional capacity and, and acting much like we would be on our own lunch breaks, they've got everything dialed down to the minute. Why? Because every minute counts when you're on lunch. Am I right or am I right? Yeah, when you clock out for lunch, you have, what, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, depending on, on, on what you do for, for work. But you have a specific window of time in order to get your chow in, in order to get a little bit of rest, a little bit of relaxation, some form of entertainment even, if, if you feel like indulging in a, in a certain amount of time that's allotted to you for your break so obviously when somebody's coming in with that kind of energy it was easy to tell it was easy to plan ahead especially with her and i at the front of the store especially with her and i at the front of the store it was way easy to see um potential prospects ones who would likely um who would likely say yes those who would likely say no but we never discounted the no's we never discounted the nose. Why? Because we wanted to sharpen this skeleton key, and I came up with the with the with the concept way after I left. I, I came up with with the concept of um, 
of, of the skeleton key way, way after I left. Why? Because we all have the ability to, uh, we all have the abilities to, to craft our own skeleton key. Very few choose to take up the challenge and, and develop it. I myself look forward to honing it and uh, really using it to get to the heart of people, of issues, of organizations and institutions. Like, I want my skeleton key to be double-edged. Motherfucking... <laughs> as, as dangerous as it is beneficial. Why? Because... I'm I'm sorry. I'm 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 skipping a piece here, but but uh I it hit me. It hit me the realization hit me that what her and I were working were working at at developing the social skills that we were building were going towards creating our own skeleton keys. But um there was uh, there was uh, some days where there was a lull and the shift and um, the volume of people who came in and out of the store to purchase food, to purchase meals dropped significantly. So we would get maybe a handful of people every hour. And when you think about it, really, really when you think about it, if you, uh, if you aren't taking into account the number of people who are in the back of the house of a restaurant, you know, there's a friend of the house of, of the workers who are actually preparing the food uh, for the customers in order to serve it up to them uh, to uh, prepare, package it at the expo station where I might be situated and then sell it off to them, bring it up at the cash register. That's the front of the house and the back of the house are those individuals who are um, preparing food to cook. So they might be back there um, chopping up, uh, slicing produce, vegetables, um, preparing meat in advance, um, maybe even a, a day in advance in order so that it marinates properly and uh, it, it leaves you with just savory meat and it's not something that you're slathering uh, marinade like a half an hour before or, you know, like made to order because then it's just meat with you know, it, it's just bland meat with sauce on it or something. It's not what you're looking for. You want, you, you do want to uh, employ some form of, um, some form of, um, of, some form of, of, well, marinating the meat because it requires time and, and it makes it much more savory uh, when it comes time to cook it. When it comes time to grill, to, to, to grill it, to cook it, saute it, what have you. So let's assume that uh, that there is, I guess, a skeleton, just just a skeleton crew, just the bare minimum number of people who are required at the in, in the front of the house to, you know, have the restaurant at least appear occupied like there's people working in there and ready to take your order. And then the rest of the crew will be in the back, you know, preparing food in advance for the hours to come for for the days to come um, organizing uh, organizing packaging and, and utensils for for the week or doing some some other form of clerical or administrative work on the manager's part um and um in these slow times when it was really slow in the restaurant are when this girl and I really got down, really got to the nitty gritty, got to the nitty gritty of what the goal was. And we got to a level of understanding. We were able to get to a level of understanding where we knew where both of our attention spans began and ended in terms of what we wanted from the customers and how we were going to go about evaluating what the customer wanted out of the experience and then converting their experience into one of satisfaction based around upselling them on the chips and walk. Now, this, this sounds crude as fuck, 
Why? Because we're we're just working to sell chips and walk chips and salsa. I mean, if if, if her and I weren't working on the line assembling the food like uh rolling burritos or making tacos what have you um we were <laughs> we were literally plotting on how to sell chips and walk and it's not something it's not something that comes mechanical it, it, it it's not it's not something that you can just read off it there is no fucking script yeah they start you with the script like uh like um like in and out like chick-fil-a uh, i've 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 worked in a in a spot. I've 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 worked for for In and Out, and they start you with the script. And the goal is for yourself to develop into a more capable employee. Now, In and Out doesn't have too many options to upsell, and it's it's more difficult to do it there. Though now that I think about it, that challenge would be fucking dope. But again, I'm not. You know, I'm I'm not. I'm not speaking on In-N-Out. I'm speaking on um, on this Mexican restaurant, this Mexican grill where I used to work, and I'm just leaving their names out for now because I haven't done any any real research on the on the SOL on if I'm violating any statute of limitations. But um, I obviously would want to remain clear of any of any violations of that yet, but I'm sure it'll come out later on. So her and I would get to uh, to the nitty gritty of of what our goals were, and uh, we would actually take take some time and um, and sit out and actually watch each other work because when it's really slow at at this point you wouldn't even uh, need uh, an expo person to be bagging up, packaging the food, selling the chips and the walk, and the drinks you know to go with the meal. The cashier would be doing it all on their own. So I believe, I don't, I forget if by this point I'd already got promoted, but I would, um, no, I'll just say I was on my break. I'll say I was on my break just for the sake of the story. So on my own break, I would sit off to the side at a, at a table, at an empty table, eating my meal and watching this girl work. And, um, and I, I was always impressed. I always learned something how she approached every interaction she 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 knew exactly what she was doing i knew what she was doing we would always critique one another on 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 our strategy on our on our performance if you will and um and every time a customer i guess and her her periphery met every time their peripheral views met is when you begin the interaction. That's honestly when you begin the interaction. Uh, some would venture to say that it begins as soon as the customer enters the, the restaurant. But uh, there are many more factors that come into play then because you have the customer walking in and maybe taking a once over of the entire crew working of the entire restaurant. Maybe they're assessing how full the place is, whether or not they can find a seat take a table and and eat in or if they're going to be you know taking out so even them evaluating the option to dine in or to to take their food away uh that that all that all comes into that all should come into the consideration of of the cashier and this girl was phenomenal so in, in, in instances where we were successful, obviously we would give each other props. And when we were not, uh, we would always we would always confer with each other and and find, try to assess what we had done wrong, what, what um, where where the attention could have been placed in the in, in the brief conversation that you have with the customer from the moments that their food is done being prepared from the line and then handed to you in order for you to package uh package it and tr- and then try to upsell them from from that moment on we would we would try to it, it's a very short window we would try to analyze and go over the uh the interaction and how it and how it unfolded between the customer and the cashier in order to the next time around. I mean, we would have, I I don't want to call it a template, but we would have um, 
another tool in our toolbox, another notch in our skeleton key that we're able to employ next time in order to reach out to the customer and unlock that yes, unlock that that ascent to the chips and the salsa, to the chips and the wok, to a drink, to an, another order of tacos even. Uh, it, got, it, it would get out of hand sometimes. Uh, the conversations that took place um, we would we would in, engage the we would try to our goal was to try to engage the customers in a way where they were as familiar with us today as they would be the next time they came in. So the comfort level there was was on on par with with a, appreciating the convenience, appreciating the fact that we were quick service. And because of it, if you needed another order of tacos to take home because your your girl or your guy had stayed home, then yeah, you could do that. And we would have an order. We would have an order of tacos uh, uh, made quickly for you sent up the line and uh, have that packaged into your into your current order we would have like we would ask oh where you where did you work or where do you work and ask them if they are on lunch and if they're considering taking any lunch back to um to a co-worker or something and and attempt to upsell them on an entire on an entire meal on, on a whole other meal um there was a there was one instance, and this is really when it clicked for me, where this cashier again I, I don't wanna I don't wanna name him I'll just I'll I'll pick a letter we'll call him M. There was a there was an instance where M was taking um, was taking care of a guest had engaged them successfully really uh, got them conversing about their afternoon, what their plans were for the evening, um, got them got them around to uh, to to start you know to 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 open up a little bit and, and actually engage with M, which is what that's really what M always shot for. I, I myself I was more of like a wild card where I would I would gauge them whether or not they were in the mood to talk and if I could I would get them to talk or try to convince them to uh, to talk but M was always the one M M M was M was one really where um, she uh, she I almost want to say she employed uh, her her feminine side a whole lot and it was a marvel to watch to watch her work and watch her do what she did. But uh, when it finally came time, for, when it finally came time for the question of, would you like some chips or salsa? Would you like some chips or walk? I forget how she phrased it. And the answer was no. And uh, there was this one time, it was one of the only times really where I saw M uh, falter and uh, almost stutter. And <laughs> and uh continued packaging the food i have to make a note to stop saying and um but continued packaging the food in order to ring them up turns to the guest one more time and asks them are you sure you don't want some fresh chips and guacamole we just got done frying up a new batch of chips they're warm and crispy and uh the guest says no 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 thank you and m took it in stride took their tender charged it out and let the customer walk let the customer go in any case it's a win-win right because the end goal is to get them to pay for their food and leave obviously we're not handing out food for free uh, on occasion, we might hand off some chips or guacamole, but this wasn't one of those cases that warranted it. Warranted? I said that right. That warranted it. And then M walks over because there was a, a brief break in the volume of people that were coming in 
walks over and asks, dude, what the fuck did I say wrong? <laughs> and I, I could only, I could only say good things, honestly, because there weren't, from my, from my evaluation, there weren't any mistakes made. I mean, we got the sale, um, not the upsell, not the chips and walk, which do count for points, but let's face it, when you're working hourly, it doesn't like you're not making you're not making commission. There is no prior agreement that I've seen yet where you're making commission for upselling on on fries and a drink, right? <laughs> so they ask, dude, Alex, yo, what did I do wrong? <laughs> and I have to be honest with them. They did nothing. They did nothing wrong. It was a, a perfect interaction. The customer just didn't want or didn't want the chips and guacamole to go with her meal. And she lets me in on on her thoughts a little bit, on her rationale, on on her on her train of logic that she was employing. And I've got to be honest, she put into words exactly what I had been doing the past couple of weeks where we held where we were holding this little private competition between her and I she said every person that walks in I'm gauging them and in my mind I'm forming or trying to find the string of words that will get them to say yes and I said I responded with every person and she said, yes. Every person has their own string of consciousness that you have to reach out and pluck to make music with. Every person is a lock and their pins are either brand spanking new or easily penetrated. And the skeleton key that her and I were working with was sharp like none other because we had each other to work with. Really that saying that steel sharpened steel absolutely rings true, especially when you have two like-minded individuals in a setting where they both benefit from learning from one another. This was one of those. So I'll leave you with that to think about is that every person, every person needs a skeleton key. Every person is a lock. Every person needs a personal interaction. Every person needs something customized and tailored to them. It doesn't have to be fucking crazy extravagant but more and more corporations more and more companies you see more and more organizations treat their guests treat their customers their patrons like a number treat their treat their clients like a case and absolutely refuse to do the legwork or the mental work that goes into making that experience a, a personal one even if it's for the sake of selling a fucking bag of chips crispy crunchy chips and some delectable guacamole <laughs> I want to thank you all for sticking around and uh, kindly ask that you Follow us on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, don't actually, I, I might suggest you unlike the page on Facebook because we've since uh, lost access to it. So um, that page, fucking do me a favor, uh, flag it, flag it and say it's fake. <laughs> on Facebook, it's incorporating associates. 
but because we don't have control of it now, I would hate for somebody to try to go in and, and vouch for control of it. So, yeah, fuck it. Shoot it down for me. On Instagram, we are Corporate Cowboys. You should see us there with um, our suit and tie holding a briefcase. On Twitter, if you want, it's Corporate Cowboys. If you want, we're not as active on Twitter, though I'd like to post more. Honestly, uh, the cost the cost to benefit there is um, is exceedingly small because of the cross posting that we'll have to do in terms of images and text. Might much rather uh, post it on Instagram now, but you never know that could change in the future. You can follow us on uh, on Patreon if you would like to subscribe. That'd be great. That'd be a blessing. Um, online at uh, Associates Incorporating Associates org. You can find the store there, or um, even our link tree if you want. You'll find the majority, if not all, of our links there to um hold on my bad just got a message you'll find uh, all the links on our link tree in terms of our store our youtube channel and where else you could find this podcast if um if you are interested in shooting us a dollar or fucking five hundred thousand dollars we'd be more than grateful and obviously every uh every penny goes a long way because your boy is gonna be uh strapped down with with the debts coming up here in the future and i mean i won't lie i don't mind it so uh, i just want to be sure that Everybody um, has access has access to uh, to follow us where they can wherever they want. And I'm gonna end this off on a, on a light note. Really, um, I know that a lot of our posts have have uh, questionable content. So yeah, you better believe that. If I can find the option to make this podcast like um, like a rated mature or some shit, I'm going to do that. But my target audience is going to be the younger people. So folks like uh, 18 and older. I know I'm not anywhere near 18 anymore, but I feel like they might benefit from having somebody to listen to who's uh, who's been 18 and um and is struggling with competing for legitimacy in the face of seniority so wherever we're you know and in, in, we're in a position where you are set up to advance only at the nod of older people essentially where they give seniority greater legitimacy than they do innovation I mean, the shit's rough, really. And young people suffer the most in that case. Why? Because they get disillusioned quick. You're speaking to somebody who... You're speaking. (laughs) You're listening to somebody who had a criminal record before they had their first girlfriend. And that's not a badge of honor that I wear. It's not something to be proud about. It's It's not something to be proud of. But... It lets me know that, yeah, sure, my priorities might have been fucked in terms of, um, in terms of social awareness, I guess. But in terms of capital awareness, I was fucking spot on. Yeah, I had issues with authority when I was younger. I had issues with, I mean, I was a really good order follower. I followed plenty of orders. But when it came time to question them, 
to question their legitimacy um that's when that's when I, I would end up catching cases you know on be it trumped up charges or, or some bullshit but your dude's always been solid your guy's always been solid I was uh, I feel like I was a corporate cowboy young early on and just started with the actual term maybe five years ago and it's something that I've grown to appreciate in myself and now would like to see in others but cultivated in a very in a very cool calculating and calm manner cool calm and collected manner <laughs> with that said I'm gonna sign off here wish y'all a rest uh, a great rest of uh, your weekend and a phenomenal week I'm gonna try to get this uploaded here and have it out before Monday but it'll likely be out uh, Monday morning the 21st the longest day of the year by the way or the longest night of the year right the longest night of the year the winter solstice or the beginning of winter so have yourselves a great one take care and good night.